that the best way to stop transmission is to ask people who've got the virus to isolate, to be away from others. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this edition of the One Young Word Together Apart series. My name is Aya Shebi, I'm the African Union Special Envoy, and I am a proud One Young Word Ambassador. I have the honor today to have with me Dr. David Nabarro, Special Envoy of the World Health Organization on COVID-19 and also co-director of the Imperial College Institute of Global Health Innovation at the Imperial College London. At a time where there is so much uncertainty and misinformation about COVID-19, Dr. David's experience and wealth of knowledge is truly invaluable. We have sourced some questions from young leaders around the world who are eager to hear from you on a number of issues. I'm sure you've been asked ton of questions every day. So I'm glad you are here with us, Dr. David. Thank you for joining. And before I begin, how are you? How is your family? How are you coping with this difficult and challenging times? Well, of course, this new virus really is new. Uh, we've never seen this particular virus before. And we're all learning about it. But we're also learning to live with it as a threat. And that affects me as well as my family my children, and even my grandchildren. Every day, I'm thinking through, what does this virus mean for us? What does it mean for our communities? What does it mean for those we love? And coming to terms with it and then making sense of it, it's something that's as much, I think, a challenge for me as it is for others. Of course, I'm lucky. I live in a, a, a comfortable situation. I'm able to work from my home. But there are many, many people who can't do this, and many people who haven't got what I've got to keep themselves healthy and safe. And so part of my focus right now is on the people who have less than me and who are fighting much more tough battles than I am because of the circumstances in which they live and they work and they... Uh, engaging with their families. I suppose mm. as I talk with you and I share my thoughts with you, I want you to encourage me to really put my mind into the minds and hearts of other people, mm. uh, particularly people who just have so much less than me. And let's see what we can do to help them to make sense of this virus and what it means for their lives. Absolutely, we are definitely privileged. I mean, I am a bit in Addis Ababa alone and it's Ramadan and I, I'm for sure miss my family, but I also feel very grateful that I at least have internet connection, which is a privilege in Africa and I can be home and safe. So we are definitely privileged, but we have uh, positions of leadership where we have a huge responsibility to deliver for people. So thank you for, uh, you know, uh, taking that responsibility and we trust your leadership. And I have the first question coming from Joseph from Kenya, who is asking if there is uh, more than one strain of COVID-19, can it continue to develop into a more severe strains until a vaccine is readily available? At the moment, this virus seems to be remarkably stable. It's staying the same. And we very much hope that it will not become more severe. We are seeing that the way it affects different groups of people is not the same. Some people seem to be more likely to develop severe illness as a result of infection. Others seem to be less likely. So for example, younger people, when they get the virus, do not get sick very often. Older people seem to get it worse. When men who are older get it, they're more likely to suffer and even to die. In the United States, there are people uh, who belong to particular ethnic groups who seem to be more likely to be ill. Early results from Africa are showing that perhaps you don't get so much severe illness as a result of the virus compared with what's happening in Western Europe and the US. So there are lots of variations in the way in which people respond to the virus, but at the moment we perceive that the virus itself is staying pretty much the same 
and, and not mutating. For Africans, is it because of the BCG vaccine? Well, yes, I've heard this suggestion that perhaps people who've been immunized with BCG, which is a vaccine that reduces the severity of tuberculosis, perhaps they are better protected. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that African populations generally are younger, and that means that they are less likely to be severely affected. And perhaps the fact that in some African communities, people have experienced many other kinds of illness gives them a bit of protection. All theories at the moment, or hypotheses, and as we get to know more about this virus, we will be better able to explain to people uh, what it really does. For now, we continue to treat it as dangerous. We continue to be always worrying about what effects it might have that we perhaps have not seen before. And so I'd like to say to everybody, don't treat it lightly, even though there are some positive signs in some communities, uh, because we've always said to ourselves, coronaviruses are particularly dangerous and nasty and have to be treated with, treated with great respect. Absolutely. And also for young people, I mean, we might not get sick, but we carry the virus with us and we may, you know, pass it on to other people. So we have to be maybe one of the most constituencies that have to be very careful to protect uh, other people in our communities. So the other question is coming from Maria from Ukraine, who is asking, if someone becomes sick with an illness unrelated to COVID-19, is it safe to go to the doctor office or hospital? And you know that uh, many feel the need now to avoid medical center at all costs. So how valid are these fears? I can fully understand that if there's a virus that's causing disease moving around in a community, people will be a bit nervous about going to a hospital or a health center. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But I, I really would encourage people not to avoid going to get treatment if they're severely ill. Uh, instead, do be careful. You know, if you keep more than uh, two meters away from somebody, uh, you are not going to get infected unless it's, it's a very unlucky situation. Uh, if you are worried, please also consider wearing a face protector of some kind because that can reduce your risk of infection. Please be very careful with hand hygiene, always washing your hands or using a hand sanitizer if, that's, if water is not available. But uh, I would still go to the hospital. I'm hearing too many uh, instances of people who are avoiding hospital and then getting very severely ill as a result. And that would be most unfortunate. And I want to just follow up on that in the case of Africa, I mean, in terms of sickness and co-infection, you know that we have already Ebola outbreak, we have HIV, we have malaria. And so maybe uh, what's your advice also to people who have uh, other diseases uh, in the continent? So I, I'm not able to say with any certainty whether somebody who's got HIV, which means that they may have a depressed immune system, whether they are likely to get more severely ill uh, if they get COVID compared with somebody who's not got the virus, uh, HIV. All work still to be done. But, uh, but I do want to make a, a, a point about what you should do if you think you might have COVID. Then you have to be really careful because you need to be uh, protecting health workers. We don't want to expose health workers unnecessarily to infection. Uh, they're in the front line. And so... Again, just respect the physical distancing rules. Uh, make sure that you tell your health professional if you think that you've got the symptoms of COVID. Make sure you are protecting yourself with some kind of uh, uh, masking. Uh, not necessarily with um, a, a, a proper mask, but you can, nowadays you can make masks, you know. Uh, there are plenty of patterns on the internet, like this one, which has been done. It falls off my ear. I've got to adjust it. And, and just something like this, if you think you might have COVID, can actually reduce the risk that you're passing it on to others because the virus is carried in droplets that come out when you talk or when you cough. And just using a face protector can reduce the risk. You have to have it properly over your nose. And as you can see, I'm having a bit of difficulty here, but that's what you've got to do is be respectful of others and try to avoid infecting them if at all possible. Absolutely. And people have been very creative in producing these masks. And I 
also want to say kudos to all the young people who have been producing masks and hand sanitizers and really on the front line of helping health workers, but also gratitude to all the health workers um, yeah. that are on the front line of this uh, pandemic. So also one of the, the things that uh, people worry about is, is mental health. And the next question comes from Alex from the UK. He is asking, as the economy starts to reopen, are COVID-19 cases and death rates expected to spike dramatically? And in what ways can public protect itself once the current restrictions started to ease? Thanks to, to the questioner. This is very, very relevant in parts of the world where there is pressure to ease some of the uh, restrictions that have been imposed. So let me just start. Uh, there, I have to be a little bit longer on this question. I, I hope you don't mind. Please. This virus is spread through the droplets that come out of our mouths when we cough, when we sneeze, even when we talk. And um, those droplets pass up to about two meters. If you're more than two meters away, you're less likely to transmit it. But the best way to stop transmission is to ask people who've got the virus to isolate, to be away from others, and to be really strict about that, and to be responsible for doing that, not to go out and about if they've got a cough and a fever and other symptoms of the disease. And it's that ability of humanity to learn that the only way to stop the spread of this virus is to interrupt transmission through isolation and to reduce the risk of transmission through physical distancing that's got to become the habit of all of us. We need help from the public health community who are going to advise us where the virus is. Now, hopefully they will also offer us tests so that we know whether they've got, we've got the disease. They will help us to trace others with whom we've been in contact so that they can isolate as well. And it's the ability of societies to know about the disease and to interrupt transmission through their own behavior supported by public health, that is the key to getting on top of and ahead of this virus. We basically make it hard for the virus to spread. I've suggested to many governments that the one thing they need to consider before they ease what we call the lockdowns and restart movement, that they have to have in place these defenses that will protect the virus from being transmitted. You see, a lockdown doesn't stop the virus from being in our communities. It just freezes the virus in place by giving it fewer opportunities for transmission. But as the lockdown is released, we have to take the actions for ourselves. We need the support from what I call the public health workers who will hopefully enable us to access tests if they're available and help us to isolate. But the public health people will also give us support as we try to protect those who are most vulnerable older people, people with diseases like high blood pressure and tuberculosis and, um, uh, and diabetes. And let's all of us work together to change our ways of behavior, to be supported by our public health services, so that as society starts to re reopen and movement restarts, then we don't get what we call return spikes of disease that then in turn mean that we get tremendous numbers of people sick and overload of health services. It's a dangerous virus. It's transmitted super fast through communities, and it will be all of us changing our behavior, all of us respecting the virus, all of us showing the responsibility that you described earlier of trying to do the best we can not to infect others. That's going to be the society of the future, for the foreseeable future, because I don't think we're all going to be protected by a vaccine for quite a number of years. And so what we do now and the way we behave is the key. And young people will be the people who will show the rest of the world what to do. Young people know about being responsible and they will want to do everything possible to make their countries as safe as possible. And it particularly applies in places where movements have been restricted, the levels of disease have come down, and there's worries that when movements restart, the, uh, uh, the levels will go up and we will get new spikes of infection. So what you're saying, Dr. David, is instead of lockdowns, we should focus on testing, tracing, tracking to contain the virus, right? Well, I, I think a lockdown just buys you time, actually. I've watched in India, for example, where the government said, yeah, we'll have a lockdown and we'll do it quickly. 
even though it's terribly painful for our nation, it hits our economy, it makes a lot of people even more poor than they already are. It means that a lot of people are short of food, that children are lacking in nutritious intake, and, and uh, there are, there's great unemployment building up. And so as to all this pain is being experienced, what also is happening in India is that huge efforts are going into building up the capacity for test, trace, and isolate, uh, or various formulations of that. That's the heart of controlling our, uh, uh, controlling the virus and keeping ourselves safe as movement restarts. Lockdown mm -hmm. is a moment to rebuild defenses in society. Lockdown is a moment to get ourselves strong and ready. And then as we emerge from lockdown, we should be able to deal with new spikes of infection as they reappear. Absolutely, and uh, maybe Ebola outbreak and how we contained it in Africa is a point, uh, is a case in point, because we, we did that uh, tracing and tracking and, and self-isolation very severely. Um, but also, I think you're very right, because the lockdowns have impacted, especially the youth population and informal sector severely. And maybe that's why it pushed may, many African government to ease uh, lockdowns to health, uh, you know, health lockdowns, and then now start uh, getting a life uh, back to normal. But that will take a lot of behavioral change and responsibility. And I would say in Africa from young people because they were the youngest and the, the largest population. So if we're more responsible, then others can also change their behavior. Uh, my next question is actually the one on uh, mental health. So it comes from Sam from Canada who asks, if social distancing is expected until a vaccine is made available, that seems a long time to come, as you said. And, and how can we as a society promote mental wellness and support meanwhile uh, basically how do we survive until then so i would like to say to sam that i wish that the term social distancing hadn't been invented because what we really are after is physical distancing keeping that magic uh, six feet apart from each other wherever possible that's what we're talking about but it's social inclusion is what's also really important we have to combine the two creating capacity for social inclusion, for well-being in our heads and in our hearts, whilst at the same time we're respecting the reality that this virus is transmitted through being up close and personal with each other. And so I totally agree that we need to put so much effort into ensuring mental well-being as we learn to live with this virus. We need to help to ourselves to be stronger and more resilient whilst at the same time we resist the impact of the disease on our bodies. Yes, mental health and well-being are critical for everybody, not just for older people. We sometimes think it's the older people who are more likely to be affected in terms of their mental well-being, but it's everybody, young people, middle-aged people, older people, even, and don't forget children. Children do not cope very well with being cooped up and, and, and protected and not able to go and play with other children. It's so important, interaction for growth and development. So let's find a way to ensure social inclusion, social engagement, whilst at the same time doing the physical distancing. Thanks to Sam for that question. This is probably a bit personal, Dr. Uh, David, but how do you keep uh, you know, strengthening your mental health? <laughs> Trouble is, I'm probably not the right judge of it. I, I mean, honestly, uh, I have bad times. Just to be honest, I have times when I feel really vulnerable, really unsure, really worried. Partly about myself, about my family, about other people. I mean, I, I do feel the pain that there is in the world today. And I suppose it's because I have a deep belief in the power of, of humanity to be able to handle these kinds of stresses. I think we have huge potential as, as human beings, a potential that's in some ways much greater than we think it is. I, I, I think that every human being inside themselves has another better person waiting to come out, waiting to be able to interact with others and to lead others. I think we're all capable of leadership. I watch you, Aya, young, but an absolutely amazing leader and able to influence others. I'm sure you have your 
down moments as well. But you build on those and you build on your own vulnerability and your own inner strength to project it to others. And part of what I believe is that that means not being scared of your own uncertainties, not being scared of your own vulnerability, not being frightened occasionally to cry, even silently, because of your, your sense of, of, of powerlessness. But, but that's what makes us strong. That's what makes us able to work with others. That's what makes us able to share love, because that's the heart of humanity. And I suppose I keep coming back to that as the core of, of what I believe in and as what I like to share with others and hope that that then enables them to lead. It's not the bosses only who do the leading. All of us can lead, whether we're young or old, whether we belong to one ethnic group or another, whether we're wealthy or poor. And it's that ability to bring others along with us and help them to be better as well that I think is key at this time. Thank you for sharing that from the heart. And I'm sure many young people can relate to that and to the difficult times that we all go on, you know, lows and highs, but we continue because we have our compassion and our empathy and our deep belief in one humanity. So I think people like you who also can keep us grounded in that vision and values of the foundation of our humanity. So thank you really for sharing that. Um, I want to move to, um, Let's say uh, Risako from Japan. He is asking how will businesses, schools, and other institutions battle bias in the fall with COVID-19, which is uh, very soon. For those who need or choose to work from home, how will they be accommodated and treated in relation to those who resume the new normal? I think those who are able to work from home actually do have some advantages because they are able to prevent from being in contact with others who might have the COVID. People who have to get on crowded public transport to go to work or people whose work means that they have to be very close up with others. For example, in uh, residential care or in factories or in uh, hospitals, uh, they find it much tougher. So part of me says those who work from home do have opportunities that others do not have. At the same time, I'm hearing those who try to work from home have other challenges. For example, particularly women find themselves expected to care for children, to look after their household, to do all the cooking and many other things, whilst at the same time going about their work. So we mustn't assume that working from home is easy, especially if you don't have much capacity in your home to compartment different aspects of life. It's never going to be a straightforward thing, this. I would say that all businesses, especially responsible businesses, understand that they have to put the well-being of their employees absolutely number one. They have to enable their employees, where possible, to maintain physical distance and not force them up close. I've been looking at statistics from the UK. Who are the people who are most likely to die with their COVID? It's people whose jobs require them to be physically close to others, like health workers, like people in residential care, like people who are working in busy uh, markets and uh, shops. And so we really have to pay attention to that. And, and it would be a really distressing thing if businesses were to say to some of their low paid personnel, well, sorry, you've got to work in those situations, otherwise you won't get paid. This is a time, for example, when the people who represent workers are going to have a very important role to play in drawing their uh, bosses' attention to the fact that the conditions under their working are difficult. And if somebody's got diabetes, if somebody's got high blood pressure, let's not force them to be up close to others who might have COVID. Let's do everything we can to protect them wherever they are. It's a time for solidarity now. It's a time for looking after other members of the human family whether we're in business, whether we're in the local government, whether we're in the national government, whether we're in a university, to try to make sure that everybody has the best possible chance to protect themselves as they go about their work. Absolutely, and other constituents you are also concerned about being home are students because now they, their education was disrupted and they're moving to do that from home. And so Raquel from Mexico is wondering, 
if a new wave of cases is expected to hit the fall, uh, should schools and universities reopen in the fall? Would it be safer to have fall semester online? And if not, how will such institution reopen and protect students and staff the same way businesses should protect their employees? Well, I think you've answered, the, uh, answered it when you said the question, and thanks to our colleague from Mexico for raising this. Of course, schools and universities have to be functioning, if at all possible. It's totally uh, not appropriate that uh, education should be seen as something that is a, a sort of option. Education is key to the future. Young people's education is absolutely critical. And you can't do it all online. Some degree of interaction is absolutely necessary. But let's look very hard at the conditions under which education takes place. Let's work hard to ensure that universities and schools can be places where physical distancing is practiced. Let's use face protection as a precaution if at all possible. Let's make sure that there is water for hand washing. I know that in many, many schools there's not water, so let's use this as a stimulus to ensure that hand washing opportunities are there and that hygiene can be practiced. Let's make sure that if students feel unwell, that they're not forced to go to classes uh, when, when they feel that they're, uh, they shouldn't be there. Then let's make sure that they can be enabled to isolate. Let's try to work hard for more internet to be available so that those who have to isolate can still uh, undertake their classes connected to others. It's, it would be really wrong if only the privileged had this opportunity and poorer people can't. This should be a real wake up call for equity in school and in universities. I'm not shouting, I'm just uh, using the words for emphasis. <laughs> Absolutely, it is well heard. So I will end with Zubin from Iran, who would like to ask you, how will health organization learn from COVID-19 pandemic? Will new protocol be introduced? Will be more research or funding geared to the future? I'm one of the public health people who for many years has said that the world is at risk as a result of infectious diseases, particularly caused by pathogens, that's viruses and bacteria, that jump from animals to humans. And I have been in that community that's been working for preparedness on this for many, many years. Uh, and I've been trying to persuade governments to give the work to improve basic public health services in the community the highest possible priority. I've said hospitals are important, but preventive public health services are also important all over the world. And I suppose I am a bit sad that it's not been possible to get this kind of approach more widely practiced around the world. So for me now, and thank you for the question, it's absolutely essential to make sure that we don't neglect public health, that we put investment in public health and community health services up at a very high level. We treat public health threats like we treat other threats to our security and we invest them in, in them properly. For people everywhere, for businesses everywhere, for universities and schools everywhere, and for our common future. Otherwise, we're always going to be vulnerable. So yes, money matters, but also political attention to public health matters. It's not an option. It's an absolute essential feature of life of the future. We must learn from this. For the sake of all those who are suffering and dying, we must learn and make sure it's built into the way in which we work for the future. It, re it empowers us, it liberates us, if we can maintain what I call health security at the community level uh, as part of the pattern of the future, in line with the whole sustainable development agenda, which very much sees health and equity as one of the basic characteristics of the future for all of us. Thank you very much for this powerful, inspiring message. And I think this is the best way to end with a call to action. I want to really thank you and be grateful for sharing your wisdom with us. Let's give a big thank you to Dr. David for his time and make sure to like, comment and share the session. Thank you for watching and take care. Thank you very much, Aya. Best wishes to everybody, strength to you all. And people like myself are really inspired to be connected with you 
through One Young World. I just want to say that there is a wonderful thing that's been developed by One Young World. It's the COVID-19 Young Leaders Fund that you've developed in order to support young people in taking forward projects around this work. I think it's great. And I'd like to give it my total unqualified full endorsement. And I hope that you get plenty of resources and that through this, many, many young people are inspired to lead for a better future. So thanks very much indeed. <laughs>